In this week's Two Wheels Better, we ride Suzuki's 600 Bandit. Carl Fogarty talks about what the future might hold and Wayne becomes an agony aunt. But first, here's Jeff Stone in Birmingham. Now, I bet you're wondering what I'm doing in a factory and I bet you're wondering what this is. And if I said to you, where would you use 50 foot of wire like this on a motorcycle, or you could say 12 meters? You'd say in the tire beads. Well, it's not tire beads, it's for spokes, would you believe? And that's what you'd use on a Triumph. And we're at Central Wheel Components in Coles Hill, and we're going to have a look at how they make a wheel, how they dimple a rim, and how they fit the nipple. Well, this area here is where you get all the raw materials in. This is all the bare wire as it comes in, stainless and bright zinc plated, all on these massive, you can't call them cotton bobbins, but that's what they're like. Then from here, they go onto the various machines for the processing. Well, this spool of stainless steel wire, this is going into this spoke machine, which is going to generally head the spokes, like on this one just here, and cut them to length. So as it goes down, goes through the rollers, through a cropping machine which crops them in two stages and then it goes through, bashes the old head over and spews it out at the end. Well this is the finished spoke of the correct length but no thread on it at all and no bend on this end. It then goes onto this machine here and it rolls a thread on this end that you can see and then puts a bend on the other end and these are Triumph spokes and this is the machine that does it. Well, these are finished spokes. They've already been swaged, but they're not polished. So they're stainless steel. We can see heat marks down there, but they've got the heads on. But they go into this machine then, which is a polishing fluid, and within it are little ceramic chips. These things here, they don't harm my hands. I've still got my fingers, as you can see, but they gently polish and bring a nice lustrous shine to these spokes. Anything for any biker to be proud of. So we'll just tip those in onto the polishing roundabout. After it's been on the polishing machine, it then comes into this, which is a bed of maize, and the maize is actually drying off the spokes. So it's still got a few chippings in there, but you actually get beautifully finished spokes, just like that, twinkling away there in the light. Beautiful, enough to make anyone proud. Having had a look all around the factory, they've got quite an operation here. And young Warren, because you are young compared with me, <laughs> Warren, it is a hell of an operation you've, you've got here. And where does the bulk of your work come from? Is it new stuff from Triumph or, or what? Well, the bulk's still predominantly from the classic bike trade. When it's, uh, people who are restoring the bikes of the 60s and 70s are coming to us for, for the parts. But obviously it's very nice to have the uh, ongoing business now with the, with the current Triumph factory where we're supplying all their original equipment wheels. Yeah, so, so that's for the, uh, the Thunderbird, is it, in, in the main? Yeah. Thunderbird, uh, Tiger and Adventurer, yes. Yeah, so that's nice standard bread and butter stuff, isn't it? No matter what else is going on, you've got that. <laughs> that's right, and then obviously hopefully in years to come we'll have the refurbishment work for that as well. <laughs> now tell me, you get stuff from uh, requests from all over the world, don't you? And what's the sort of furthest away that you've had? Well, we deal with Australia and New Zealand, but probably the uh, strangest we had, we had a, a chap flying from America to book, book his wheels in on a while you wait service, where we, uh, we actually, he, he landed in Manchester, um, came down by taxi to Birmingham, dropped his wheels off. Uh, we arranged to, for him to go around the corner to a local leisure centre to have a breakfast and uh, a bit of a freshen up, and he came back, picked his wheels up, finished, went back up to Manchester and flew home to America. That's an expensive set of wheels. Was he a regular customer? I mean, did he did he know of you of old or what? No, he, uh, he'd been told in the States that he was using them for racing, uh, racing of classic bikes, and he was told there was only one place to go if he wanted the wheels built properly, and uh, he took the advice and came over here. Oh, great. And he was uh, he was pleased with it, I presume. Has he come back? <laughs> well, not that <laughs> since, which is uh, good in one respect, because it means he's had no problems. So. Yeah. Well, tell me, seeing all these wheels here, all the old spoke technology as you wear, did you see a dip off in trade in the early 70s when alloy wheels came on board? And, uh, at that stage the company was very, very small. It was really sort of a, a one-man band. Um, so there was always plenty of work to keep my father busy. Uh, busy. 
Um, it's only really the last 10 years that we've accelerated to the levels that we are now, uh, where obviously we're, we're supplying all the other wheel builders in this country as well with the products. Yeah, so you've managed to sort of balance the, uh, the sort of market demand. So your production is a nice position to be in that, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's a little niche, really. We, um, we were never big enough to be a major uh, force in the supply of rims, um, but um, we filled in that little gap there where we're not too, sm too small to supply all the wholesalers. Yeah. So you touched on this being your father. It's been a, f uh, a family firm, hasn't it? It started 1900-ish, was it? Yeah, just before 1900. We've got some records from 1897 of uh, my great 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 grandfather dealing with Dunlop in those days. Yeah. So that would in the wooden wheels as well, I presume people would have been would making have them. So they? Then, yes. The wooden spokes. Yeah. Yep. No wooden spokes now. No. <laughs> Please sir. Well here's the finished spokes. Have a, a handful of nipples to go with the spokes. Nicely plated. These are the ones that are actually plated on brass to stop corrosion. Beautifully finished alloy hub. And here we have the light alloy rim. And from these four components, this is where we go with the completed wheel. Well, this is a, a laced wheel, but just loosely assembled. You can see the nipples popping through there. So all the spokes are in, all in the right order, all assembled, ready to go. And then it goes over onto the table over here, where it's pre-tensioned then, before it goes onto truing. Well, after the wheel, has, the spokes have been pre-tensioned, it's then put onto this little machine, where it's then actually trued up. So this is with the hands-on bit, where each nipple is just given that little tweak and using a dial gauge, make sure it gets absolutely smack on true. The rim itself has to be centered on the hub and so that's got a, a six millimeter um, dimension on either side and then there's a tolerance to it as well which is within one millimeter to make sure there's no wobbles in the rim and it's got to be not only has it got to be side to side smack on but it's got to be smack on up and down as well so uh, you've got to keep a constant radius which is why these two wheels are here either side they're measuring the uh, radius and the run out side to side. When you were saying uh, earlier that you refurbish classic wheels and veteran wheels, vintage and all the rest of it, and so what sort of condition is a typical condition that you get a wheel in? Well, as you can see, we've got one here that's come in. Uh, this is off a of Norton. Yeah. It's coming in this condition. It's obviously 30 odd years old. We'll take it, we'll strip the wheel out, send the hub off and have it blasted and powder coated or, and bring it back into this sort of condition. We then decide what rim the customer wants, we we'll check it out. Uh, if it's an English chrome rim, you've already seen the process where we, we have a mild steel rim and we dimple it, put the holes in it to fit the, the rim, to fit the hub, sorry, and uh, then build it up. Uh, if it's an aluminium rim, we pull one down off the shelf, already dimpled, same again, put the holes in, and then bring it and assemble it. Now, do the dimples, I know the punching is peculiar to that particular wheel, isn't it? Is that right to get the spoke angle? That's right. But what about the dimpling? Does that tend to be pretty standard? Have you got more tolerance in the dimple? Does it? The, the dimpling's pretty standard. Uh, yeah. There are some uh, strange configurations where there's a 2x2 two two or 3 by one dimple. Yeah. But uh, by and large, the standard w one left, one right is the is a standard dimple. And then it just depends on how big the hub is and the dimensions of the rim to get the angles right for um, punching the holes through. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. And as you can see, the finished uh, finished wheel, gone from a rusty has-been to yeah. uh, ready to go back on the bike, even a bit of paintwork done on the rim. all from Central Wheel so I really must be gone but we'll be back next week and I've had enough now for dimples and nipples and all that sort of thing so I'm off. Welcome to a new bit on Two Wheels Better. This is exciting isn't it? We don't have new bits, we don't have many bits actually. This is Wayne's Agony Corner and the idea of Wayne's Agony Corner is because we're actually getting quite a lot of correspondence into the office about problems people have had with the choice of bikes, the choice of bits and pieces, fixing the bikes, uh, a general sort of questions really that you would ordinarily put pen to paper for and write to such people as ourselves who you think know what the hell we're doing. Well we don't, but we're willing to find out some answers and let you know. So, I shall answer a few that have already been sent and I shall give you an address later on as to where to send your questions to. Now then, this gentleman here, Mr Longford, now, 
He's got a CX500. Um, he's had an insurance claim for writing it off. So he couldn't have got much for it. Not for a CX500 anyway. Um, paid out in full for it. And now he decided he wants his bike back. So he can repair it. Well, that doesn't work like that, I'm afraid. Uh, the idea is, once you've been paid out in full for your claim, that machine or any clothing, accessories or whatever, belongs then to the insurance company. So, our chips. But... The way to go about it is, in the future, if you want your bike back and you feel you can repair it, the way to do it is to get, you'll get your figure for a total payout. You then write back to them to say, I would like my bike back. They'll reduce that figure by what they believe is the salvage rate for your machine and pay you out the amount of money and you get your bike back. It's yours just as it was before, only bent and broken and you repair it. So bear that in mind. As the negotiation goes on, you must propose beforehand because as soon as the final payment is made, everything belongs to the insurance company and they can do with it what they want. All right, well, that's that little problem solved. Now then, Mr. Briggs, who's got a T595 Triumph, beautiful machine, and already, even only though he's just bought it, he wants some information about exhaust systems for it. Well, there isn't a lot done. Scorpion. Scorpion, that is with a K, not Scorpion with a C. There's two different companies. Scorpion with a K are exotic exhausts. They even make them with titanium metal, polished alloy, all sorts of fancy stainless steels and bits and pieces. A beautiful system, but will cost you around 700 quid for on a T595. Big bucks. And in the near future, apparently Yoshimura are going to do them as well. Uh, they're doing a complete system, but currently they do cans that can go on it. So consult your local dealer. But there are things done for your T595, although I think the exhaust system that's on the bike is pretty good to start with. Um, so there's a few answers for a few questions. So basically, if you've got anything you want to know, doesn't matter how serious, as long as it's not of a sexual nature or anything like... Oh, excuse me, I don't get a call very often, but I've got one. Hello, Wayne Kirsch, your two words better. Hello, ah, are you doing then? All right. Yes, well, so what do you want to know? Well, actually, we're doing a piece now. Uh, we're actually filming currently as we speak, and we're doing a piece now uh, that happens to be. Uh, a, well, yeah, it's. Well, we're answering all sorts of questions. Well, I'll tell you what, you've got to write to us. Yes, write to us, Two Wheels Better. Put Wayne's Agony Corner. And uh, that's at Granada Satellite Television, Key Street, Manchester. Are you listening? Because I'm telling you all now. Uh, M69EA. So if you write to us, you can. I'll give you some answers. That was about grey imports, grey bikes. Well, grey bikes, red bikes, blue bikes, any colour bikes, who gives a hoot? They're all very, really nice. But grey bikes is the general term used for parallel imports. That's second-hand machines that are brought in from Japan, Europe in general, brought over here and then sold to you, or brand new machines with kilometres on the clock, whatever, and a few changes makes them into an official machine. Uh, they cost a little less, it's a little bit of a sore subject with the traders and the dealers at the moment and the industry in general. So maybe we'll touch on the subject uh, next time on, uh, on Agony Corner. So put pen to paper and write to Wayne's Agony Corner. Alright, see you soon. Now Aaron Slides, he's going to have a go at car racing with, um, with Honda, British Touring Cars. Do you fancy having a crack at that? Yeah, I'd love to have a go. Um, uh, you know, it's something I'd, I'd probably have a go when I give up racing. Maybe have a, a go this winter with uh, Vauxhall. They seem pretty keen. They're they're actually going to give me a car just to to use for running around in a, a Vectra. So I'm looking forward to getting that off them and hopefully doing, doing a bit of testing with them, maybe in one of their touring cars. So I'd like to have a go at it. I think uh, I think I'll go all right. You know, I think I'll probably crash a lot to start with, but you know, I'm sure. <laughs> Did after you hear that, <laughs> Man, that would be nothing new, would it, in British well, touring car stuff? I mean, they've yeah. got all this metal around them. You must be envious I of I think them, that's why. It? I think as soon as you get in the car, you think, oh, I can't get hurt in this <laughs> yeah. thing. You know, and you're going right. to... You know, I'm not like when I've had a... Go in a car around, a, a rental car around a track or something. You go up, absolutely crazy, end up on the grass and stuff, yeah. you know. But it'd be nice to have a go at it. You know, I want to do it again for me. I know I'm like, I need to be winning. So I know I'd have to sort of walk before I could run at that level. But, you know, I'll, I'll give it a go, definitely, and have a go, see how it goes. That's right. But when you say that you've done a little bit, then when you said this rent a car, so it's not like a Hertz rent a car, is it? No, <laughs> you've actually do that been on a Hertz rent a car. Me? <laughs> you've actually been on one of these things, on these sort of race school things, where you can just borrow um, a car at the circuit, have you? No, I've never done anything to be honest. I've never properly driven a car around a track or anything. You know, it's something I've never got. I'm planning to do a bit this winter with one of my sponsors from uh, from Norfia, who's, who runs a pickup. Uh, 
you know, some British touring, touring car for pickup sort of thing. I don't know how it works. He said he's got that. We'll go out in that winter and do a bit of testing that. So it's something I want to do this winter because it's something that I've been wanting to do and I keep, get, I keep not getting around to it. But this winter I'm going to do it and have a go at it. And why not? Now, one thing that's just crossed my mind, I mean, you're used to driving the motorhome. What about following Steve Parrish and racing bloody great trucks around? No, that doesn't do anything for me at all, I think. It? it seems boring. It's boring to watch, is that? Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. It's not something I'm interested in racing trucks at all, really. Because Steve laps it up, though, doesn't he? I mean, yeah, he, he loves it. Like, you know, it's, well, he, he goes well, you know, he's won the championship a couple of years running, so. Yeah. But I don't really fancy driving trucks around, to be honest. And they leave a lot of rubber on the track for the bike riders as well. Yeah, don't they? <laughs> they make a lot of noise and uh, leave some nice big grooves in the tarmac <laughs> for us. So. I ain't a big fan of them, to be honest. And so it's to uh, look out for Carl then on, um, on four wheels then, of all things, eh? Well, you never know. Um, it'd be nice, just like I say, to have a go in one and see how we go. You're going to be watching Aaron Slight anyway, no doubt. Pretty I'll close. not be watching. I'm not, I'm not going to go down to Donington <laughs> at least Sunday. I mean, <clears throat> but uh, I'm sure I'll read about how he's gone. I think he'll go well because Aaron, I think, has had a few goals in cars, and I'm sure he's he'll be up there somewhere. What about that? anything else for the sort of future? You thought of running a sort of a bike dealership? Is it something involved with bikes at all, or, or when you, if you left bikes, would you leave them? I'm not sure. Things change uh, from week to week, from year to year. I, when I give up racing, I just want to say at moments I just want to sit back and just take stock of my life and maybe take a year off and do nothing but uh, we'll just have to see I mean things change all the time I could end up in bikes or I might not I just don't really know at this moment yeah we'll wait and see what the future brings wait and see whatever it'll be will be so maybe you want something a little different well you certainly have a problem parking one of them on your drive but what you'll see on many people's drives at the moment is a 600 cc because it seems to be the most popular class, or the middleweights as they're now referred to. And it's certainly true to say that the average rider can't ride a powerful 900 any faster than he or she can ride a decent 600. And there's lots to choose from. Honda, Kawasaki, Yamaha, you name it, they all do decent 600 sports bikes. And if it's off-road bikes you like, well, there's KTM, Aprilia, Suzuki, and a few more. But a popular class these days is the one that they're calling the all-rounder. And this is the all-rounder that's outsold all its rivals, the Suzuki 600cc Bandit. What is it with you cameramen and boats? Just forget the boats today, with bikes today. Now I said it had outsold all its rivals. Well that really depends on how you interpret sales figures. You see the top selling bike for many years now has been Honda's brilliant CBR 600. But unfortunately for Suzuki, the Bandit actually comes in two versions. There's this version, the naked unfaired version, this is the GSF 600. And then there's the GSF 600S, which is a half fared version. And unfortunately, in the sales figures, the sales charts, they're actually classed as two different models. But if you add both the figures together, you'll find they absolutely outsell everything else on the road. And why? Well, because it's so damn good at everything. When it was launched in 1995, a Bandit like this would have cost you just four grand. And now the price is up to a touch over 4,700 for this version, the naked version, you still get an awful lot of excitement for your money. And if you want the half third version, that'll cost you round about an extra 300 quid to touch over five grand on the road. So what do you get for your 4,700? Well, you get the same engine that Suzuki use in their RF 600 sports bike, slightly detuned, but still not a bad performer. Capable of delivering around 78 brake horsepower, and it'll take you to a top speed in excess of 125 miles per hour. Although if you're planning on going anywhere near that for more than a few miles, you really need neck muscles like Mike Tyson, or better still, by the half fared version, it's a lot easier to hang on to at high speed.
Well, it's not quite bandit country, I know, but it's the nearest thing we could find round here. Anyway, it's better than looking at another chuffing boat, isn't it? On to the real bandit. You know, there's nothing that special, really, about the engine, about the brakes, the chassis, or anything else for that matter. It's a fairly basic bike, a kind of retro-looking, sort of simple-looking machine. It just all works so well when it's packaged like this. You know, when it first came out, the Bandit, people referred to it as a parts bin special. Can you believe that? Well, how we live and learn, don't we? The Bandit's got to be a serious contender for maybe the best value for money of all time award. And if you're not turned on by fancy graphics and race replicas and fairings and going fast and all that, and you still want to have a lot of fun, then maybe this would just fit the bill. So you might be wondering what it's like to ride a Bandit. Well, it's an awful lot of fun. Quite exciting, very, very, very comfy. You could sit here all day and get no aches and pains at all. And unlike modern sports bikes, when the engine doesn't really start to deliver its power till it reaches about 5,000 revs, the Bandit motor delivers the power really cleanly throughout the rev range, from about 2,000 revs upwards. It's very, very smooth, a lovely power delivery. Fast enough for lots of excitement, but not fast enough to really frighten you. And should the 600 not be powerful enough, the Bandit comes in a 1200 version as well. And again, that's available in the two models. You've got the naked, unfaired like this, and then you've got the half-faired. And a 1200 will cost you at six and a half grand unfaired and 6,800 quid or thereabouts with the half-fairing. And if you're into serious arm-wrenching power and monster wheelies, then the 1200 is the one. So next time you're looking at a new bike and you're walking down a line of bikes for sale, don't walk past the Bandit thinking it's boring, it's plain, it's basic, it's unexciting. It's certainly not. You could do a lot worse. In next week's Two Wheels Better, Jeff Stone talks to Jamie Whittam at Donington Park. <laughs>